Welcome to Southeast Queensland Skies. Today I'm just going to be going through the following. It's two nights observing, in quotes, with a Canon DSLR. The aim was that I usually shoot single 30 second JPEG frames in order to do uh, observations or electronic assisted astronomy out there in the field with a camera instead of using an eyepiece. But I am slowly heading towards more astrophotographic quality of those images. The 30 second JPEG frames allow me to do pretty decent as you can see by some of my other YouTube videos should you click on my channel and look around for those videos. Uh, but the aim is really to get even better quality and still to use the tools that I'm familiar with which uh, I'll detail in a second. So the aim was to learn the differences when shooting RAW instead of shooting JPEG and also to learn how to stack and nicely stretch those images using the tools that I already know and am familiar with. don't particularly want to pay a lot of money and start learning Pixinsight for instance. I just want to keep using my Astra Toaster and any other bits of software that I already own. Okay, The usual equipment is used. Uh, my Skywatcher HEQ5 Pro Equatorial Mount it's got the Rowan Astronomy belt drive modification to it, which I installed myself. It had on, uh, on top of that mount the Skywatcher 200p, uh, 200 being the millimeter size of aperture, in other words, 8 inch. And it's an F5 Newtonian uh, primary and secondary mirror reflecting tube. And at F5, it's a thousand millimeter focal length. It's unguided. I uh, have bought an ASI 120 mono camera to guide uh, but I haven't started using it yet and I want to push uh, learning all these tools which I'm about to uh, go through uh, and what I talked about earlier how to shoot raw and how to stack and nicely stretch those images I really want to do it step by step process instead of jumping straight into uh, shooting raw, learning how to stack multiple images, learning how to stretch them in Astra Toaster, plus learn to guide, plus learn to get around all the foibles of areas of the sky where guiding might need slightly different tweaks in the guiding software and so on and so on. Rather than jump straight into that, I want to just take it step by step. I'm using my usual Canon 650D full spectrum modif modified but uncooled camera. The Canon 650D full spectrum mod simply means it has no infrared filter. It's letting all IR light through. So if I take a normal photograph in the daytime with that camera, everything has a red hue over absolutely everything. There are ways around that and one of them is to take a custom white balance with the camera. And if you do that and shoot JPEG, then the, the frames are automatically color balanced, which is why I was doing that in the past. Uh, so now I'm shooting raw, I have to learn to get around that a different way, and I'll explain that later. I'm using my MacBook Pro, which was around 2008, 2009 ish, 2009, 2010 ish manufacture, not quite sure when. Bought it second hand. It's currently uh, boot camped, it's not running OS X, it's boot camped with Windows 7 because Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, runs on Windows 7. I have tried to use wine tools and other utilities to get it to run uh, but it needs to have full interaction between DSS and Astra Toaster which is also only designed to run on Windows so um, yes, you, you, while I can winify DSS by itself it needs to winify DSS running in conjunction with DSS Live running in conjunction with Astra Toaster and I haven't figured out a way to do that yet. So it's Bootcamp running Windows 7. The camera control, uh, the actual gain or ISO exposure time and indeed the intervalometer side of it which is how many frames to take using that exposure time and ISO and the live view video feed is all done using Canon EOS utilities. Very easy, very simple to use, and it'll do me. 
Yes, people have su suggested using others like Backyard EOS and uh, APT and a few other things. Um, nah, I've tried them out there. Nah, not interested. I'll just keep using Canon EOS Utilities. Very simple, free, comes with a Canon camera. And as you'll see by some of the shots, um, very, very handy. Um, and it just says frames in a folder monitored by Astro Toaster. I'm using Astro Toaster 2.05C, which is automatically loading and stacking frames and allowing me to do color adjustments on the fly from the very first frame. You don't have to take nine shots, then wait for them to stack, then see the result. You simply start the intervalometer and the very first shot that comes in, you can see it in Astro Toaster and start to make the color adjustments. And while you're doing that, the second shot might come in and so on and so forth until finally, in my case, I took nine frames nine frames further on um, I stopped and just had a good look at what was going on and really tried to tweak the best out of it using the Astro Toaster color adjustments. A bit more on that later. Uh, I was actually testing a new version of DSS in the background um, and I found uh, basically that it used to be a 32-bit app and now they've got a beta out which is uh, shown there, DSS Deep Sky Stacker 4.1.0 Beta 1. I think they've got a official version out now. 64-bit and it actually on my MacBook with all of the above software it um, it's actually about 30% faster than the old 32-bit. So 9 frames were opening in the old 32-bit or sorry not opening, were stacking were being found, being stacked and fully presented in Astro Toaster. 9 frames 32-bit around about 16 minutes, uh, 9 frames in the 64-bit around 11 to 12 minutes, so 30% faster roughly. The site, and I should have said sites, there I went. Uh, first night, 8th of April, I went to Lake Wairarolong, about an hour from Brisbane. The Brisbane to Gold Coast corridors got around about 2.7, 2.8 million people in it, and it's over in the east of Lake Wairarolong, so quite a lot of sky pollution over in the east uh, being roughly 50 kilometers as the crow flies from that 2.7-2.8 uh, million people corridor. Uh, Mugara Dam is about another 40 minutes further west away from that sky glow uh, and I shot there on the 13th of April. Both are Bortle Skies 2 uh, magnitude 17 to 21 with wire line being around at 17.5 18 and uh, magnitude and Mugara Dam being able to get to mag 21 although with my Canon cameras I don't get that much so that's uh, that bit um, so straight up a bit of a warning you can't necessarily connect a Canon DSLR to your telescope and get the same kind of results as what you're seeing in uh, the images that you see uh, I've got a very, you know, it's a pretty fast f ratio, f5. There are some at f4, but they're a little bit harder to collimate. But the general rule of thumb is um, if yours is, a, say, an f6, uh, the exposure time doesn't go up by sort of like uh, one fifth, it goes up by 1.5 times the difference between uh, uh, f6 and f5. If you go just up another stop to f7, an f7 telescope, then uh, compared to my shots, you'd have to double them longer, actually double them to get the same effect. And if you're using F10, well you'd have to shoot four times longer. So I'm shooting 60 second shots in this video. So at F10 you'd have to go four minute shots and stack nine of them to get the same results that I get at F5. Okay, uh, and as I say there, um, my sights are pretty darn dark, not totally, they're not bottle uh, one, uh, but um, yeah, you might be in a far more light polluted site, okay? Next, uh, all images you see uh, were processed live out in the field. As a matter of fact, they are screen uh, excuse me, screen grabs. So I'm clicking the shutter, and this is an old so slide, apologise, I said 30 seconds. Uh, they, these are uh, we're 60 second shots, ISO 800, and nine of them stacked. Okay, but all the colour sliders are seen in the video. Um, they're exactly what I shot them at because they are screen grabs. Okay, so that's it. I um, don't have to worry about all this stuff down here anymore. Uh, so I'll just leave that there and kick on with. I'll just 
going to discuss these because I'm not going to let you guys wait for 11 or 12 minutes to watch the stacking. So first up, this image, what's this about? Uh, this is showing, and let me just get to the maximum screen here. This is showing the Canon Live View facility. So over here, this is Canon EOS Utilities controlling the camera because it's a live video feed in what's called Live View. It's 60 odd frames per second, I think it is. It is live video. You see Jupiter sort of in the image, bouncing, wobbling a little bit with atmospheric conditions. Uh, and you can see it's set uh, to ISO 100, 1 25th of a second. And all those settings do is kind of change how this live view is presented. It is a five times zoomed view, which is simply uh, this button down here and that was Jupiter on the night. So uh, very clear, beautiful atmospheric conditions because it's been raining like crazy here and uh, all of a sudden one night it uh, was crystal clear on April the 8th and I took quite a few images on that day and then it clouded over. It's been raining and windy ever since and then on uh, uh, the 13th it just magically cleared up again until about 10.30 when once again it fully clouded over. You couldn't even see Jupiter which is you know, a very, very bright object. So yeah, I'm trying to battle in between the terrible weather that we continue to have through our autumn. Uh, hopefully winter shortly will be better. But there you have it, that, was the, that is a live view, direct 60 uh, video 60 frames per second video feed if, you, uh, feed. if you understand what Canon Live View is, you'll understand what that is. Um, so very, very beautiful atmospheric conditions on that night because the rain has got rid of any heat haze, got rid of any smoke haze, got rid of any dust. Got you know, it's really cleaned the atmosphere up. It was, it was a really wonderful time. All right, so that was the first image. Uh, the first place I went to on the this is the very first stack I took. Um, and it's of the um, Omega Centauri cluster. Very, I think it's the brightest in the southern hemisphere. So this was my very first go at these color adjustments. So what you see here is in this particular case on this night I um, had read a Clark Vision website where the guy goes into great detail about why you should shoot 1600 above the uh, sensor gen website's noise um, level of um, all cameras. Now I've normally in the past shot at ISO 800 with JPEG and got fantastic results but I thought what the hey, oh, this guy obviously knows his stuff, I'll try to say 1600. Later on you'll see the shots I took on the 13th of April were actually back to ISO 800 because straight away ISO 800 has half the noise of what it does at 1600. Not that you see much noise here because that's why you stack. And you'll see here it's got down at the bottom of the image it says it had stacked nine shots out of nine that, that were received in the folder. By the way Astro Toaster is totally non-destructive. The uh, raw files are still in that folder. Uh, you can just pick them up the next day, copy them off and use PixInsight or anything you like to stack them. Um, so it is non-destructive and um, it just basically is saying look I've seen nine shots and I've now stacked all nine. While you're watching you see this change like one slash one, one slash two, two slash two and so on until it's finally stacked all nine. Okay, a little bit of a weird thing I noticed with um, uh, the Astra Toaster stacking process uh, with the 64-bit. It keeps up like getting up to like seven slash seven Remember I'm taking one minute shots here. So it basically keeps up right up to 7 slash 7. And then it sort of goes 7 slash 8. In other words, I've still only stacked 7, but I've now received 8 files. And then it goes 7 slash 9, i.e. I've still only stacked 7 shots and now received 9. And it sits there for at least another 2 or 3 minutes before finally it catches up and goes stack 9 out of 9. I have no idea why, but it did it every single time. No idea why. If it had kept up, then 9 would have been stacked in 9... 9 60 second shots would have been stacked in 9 minutes plus 1 for the last frame to stack, so 10. But it didn't. It, it didn't keep up. I have no idea why. So very first shot and very first colour adjustments. And the very first thing I noticed 
is I had to whack the brightness level almost completely hard over to the left. And I probably went a little bit too harsh on it because you can see it's, yeah, yeah it's a bright image, but it's not absolutely sparkling like I often get with my JPEG shots. Um, and I also noticed this later with the nebula, by the way. The JPEG shots in the nebula were far more blown out in the past, and it was a lot uh, smoother, less, I don't know, I wouldn't say less dynamic range, but um, yeah, in my JPEG shots, this core region is almost, you know, you can't see individual stars in there. Kind of the difference between RAW and JPEG. I guess the JPEG conversion just sees this as a massive bright in the core and um, it, it kind of gives it almost a three-dimensional effect actually out there in the dark but nevertheless um, with JP uh, sorry with RAW I've had to drop the brightness way over to the left and I noticed in the old 32-bit version I didn't have to go that far this remember is DSS 64-bit version so a little bit odd I don't know why that is all right so again just looking at the slider on my uh, JPEG shots I'd have it right in the middle its default position. In the 32-bit DSS it would be probably about where the cursor is there, about a third of the way to the left, but in the 64-bit version with DSS running in the background it's way over on the left hand side. Okay, and here's all the other sliders. All of these were exactly the same. Okay, the all I'd done by the way, a very very interesting and wonderful way to shoot these, is um, when they are JPEG shots, if you click this auto expand button here, it's a garish, nightmare, horrible image. But with RAW, when you click this auto expand button, it's pretty darn good. All I've done is click that auto expand button and it's automatically set pretty much all of these barring a lens gradient, which I'd noticed, very much brighter around like a big, well, vignetting. You could see a real black edges and it got progressively um, brighter into its middle so I've had to increase the lens gradient to get rid of that vignetting and second thing I had to drop the brightness way down like, like it shows there everything else was exactly as auto expand so pretty sweet actually very easy to do alright so on to the next shot I'm not sure what happens if I click this next shot right arrow here let's see if it goes to the right one I'm not sure that's the right one let's have a look here ah yes it is alright alright so then I went to Centaurus A which is very close to Omega Cent uh, Centauri cluster and um, this is the still in Astra toaster it's a different view. When you click this button up here and go into full screen, you get this kind of image, okay, which enables, and by the way, if in this image I double clicked at night, it keeps that full screen image, okay, and just hides the menu bar and hides the color adjustment. So you're left with nothing more than the image covering your entire screen. It's, it's actually a beautiful way to observe because, um, you know, uh, this is actually a little bit more, let me go back to this shot, you can see there I've got the viewer window open to this size, where I'm wiggling the mouse, but you've got other screen real estate taken up by all this other stuff. And you don't have to hide any of that, you just click this full screen button and you go straight into that, you just double click it anywhere here and that hides and that hides. So it is a, <clears throat> a lovely viewing tool, I just love Astro Toaster to do all this stuff with. Uh, by the way, it's it's a free download at the moment, and the guy in the States, uh, Howie Levine, should really start charging for it. I'm sorry to say this to everybody, but uh, it is wonderful software. But anyway, you can see some of the dust laying coming down here. At least I can on my monitor. I'm not sure whether you can in the YouTube video. And up the top here as well, uh, my brightness is adjusted. I can just see it. But you can see huge amounts of detail. All this little wispiness going on in here with the dust lanes. These, the dust wisping back through here. The core region is beautiful and smooth, which is actually stars, by the way. Uh, stars and other dust in that galaxy. It's just it's a long way away. And it's edge on. So this is kind of like spiral arms. Interesting how one kind of bends up here and this one bends down here. I've no idea why. It's almost like it's got a bit of rotation going on uh, counterclockwise, which is kind of leaving this dust lane this way and leaving that dust lane that way. But um, yeah, lovely image, I uh, love it. And again, all I did was click this auto expand. 
you can probably see the settings again all these are the same okay it just adjusted itself basically and once again I just had to um, adjust the lens gradient and the brightness now I didn't have to go quite as far with the brightness and uh, but even so it's pretty easy to do if you realize that when you get those stacks in you just click that and worry about lens gradient and then brightness in that order uh, and you get something like that very very quick but you've had to wait nine minutes plus a couple of other minutes for nine to stack oh one more thing on why did I stack nine well the general convention is a lot of maths and uh, to prove it and a lot of people who reckon no, it's rubbish but <laughs> what do you do uh, at the end of the day the maths and many people a lot smarter than me uh, say that um, if you stack nine okay well three times three is nine isn't it so if you stack nine you're getting three times the signal to noise ratio as you are getting in one frame in that stack okay three times the signal to noise ratio in other words you can tease out a lot more detail the other way of looking at that is to remember it is a ratio of signal to noise because what it's actually doing it's reducing the noise in the final stack of nine is one third of the noise in each individual frame uh, in other words that's a ratio so <laughs> it's three if you talk about signal to noise okay and only one third if you're talking about noise per frame but that's why I stacked nine now I could have stacked 16 and got four times the signal to noise but if you think about it then I'm getting an extra 30% uh, signal or signal to noise ratio better signal to noise ratio 30% better signal to noise ratio if I shot 16 but it's almost double it's become instead of uh, nine one minute shots I'm now doing 16 one minute shots and it seems to take even longer to catch up when I've tried that and uh, it ends up those 16 one minute shots end up about 23 minutes before I see them stacked so in other words I'm going twice as long before I see the final result to get a 30% slightly better signal to noise ratio so I just went no, stuff it not prepared to wait the time especially given I was constantly battling uh, cloud coming and going so in the end we just stacked um, I, I just stacked nine <coughs> okay next shot uh, this is M83 Galaxy uh, again close by to all those areas where uh, seem to be less bothered by cloud and stuff in the sky down here in the southern hemisphere <coughs> M83 is above a whole bunch of sky glow down here by the way that's this is pointing towards the eastern Brisbane to Gold Coast corridor of 2.8 million people but it turned out fine now um, again I was still shooting 1600 still shooting nine shots uh, and you can see here this again is the full screen real estate um, you can see it was bold because I was setting uh, 60 seconds times 9 in the intervalometer which is this little thing here uh, but there you go uh, that's M83 and I zoomed in on it and once again this is the, now the full screen view and I've zoomed in on it and uh, you're starting to see detail now uh, I will later on uh, show you this image which was my first go at this using stacking and all of that and at ISO 1600 and I'll show you the equivalent image I shot it again uh, the other the next night uh, or the 13th with ISO 800 and um, you know so forth uh, by the way you can see star trailing happening here and what had happened was the battery uh, when I saw this I checked the battery level in the uh, Skywatcher and for some reason my um, big dry cell even though I charged it trickle charged it overnight it was after just a few shots like all those other shots all those other images that I showed you there it was already starting to tell me that um, it was only it only had 12.2 volts and with those big dry cells you're supposed to actually stop using them at, them at that point and put them on charge so I don't know why but the overnight charge I think one of the cells has dropped or something in that battery anyway so I 
put another battery on, uh, another couple of batteries, and, and uh, you'll see later on they're not quite as blurred. But th that star trailing that you can see like here is probably accounting for why this, why this isn't such a great sharp shot. Uh, okay. Next one, even more zoomed in, uh, but again you can really start to see these oblong star trails where it just didn't quite have enough juice to, to go. Um, not going to harp on about that one. Uh, it's just zoomed in, which is this button right here in Astro Toaster. Alright, this was um, with a new battery on and this was a uh, sombrero. Um, again, first automatic stretch and muck around and then I zoom in on it I believe here we go there we go zoomed in so pretty sweet um, etc etc and uh, as a matter of fact uh, I'm pretty sure I had the battery on but I do see little star trails going on there uh, it was obviously at some point that I did change the battery now Markarian chain um, I just thought oh well I'll start to, all, everything else is pretty bright I thought I'll go on to some uh, faint fuzzies these are all around mag 11 to mag 13 so pretty dim but also pretty much at the extremity of what I've ever taken using the Canon DSLR um, it's an uncooled camera oh another thing about that by the way it's an uncooled camera and yet there are no hot pixels in here and the reason is I used a trick again from the Clark Vision guy so uh, kudos to him when you are using the Canon DSLRs there is a menu option to um, do a manual sensor clean and what it does is it vibrates the sensor to get rid of any dust off of it at that time but more importantly uh, Clark Vision says it remaps the hot pixels up to that point when you turn it all off it goes back to the factory default hot, hot pixel map but if you still have the camera on and you do that uh, sensor clean it remaps hot pixels so I did exactly that before I took each um, went to the next target I simply uh, unfortunately I had to go to the back menu I couldn't figure out how to do this over here in Canon EOS utilities I went to the um, back of the menu uh, the LCD screen at the back of the camera and I physically uh, had it locked into that menu option to do sensor clean and I simply said do a sensor clean and you hear the camera buzz a little and you don't turn it off you just leave it on and you start shooting and none of these raw shots I found any hot pixels and yet it was taking uh, a 60 second shot with about a 5 second break and then another 60 second shot and it was just going continuously and there are right even at the end of the evening there were no, <laughs> there was no hot pixels so that is a fantastic tip I'm really impressed with that um, staggered in fact um, my JPEG shots used to always get hot pixels um, and apparently yeah it doesn't apply that to the in-camera JPEG uh, conversion Mr. Clark Vision says that uh, but it certainly applies it to um, to the raw uh, file that comes out of the camera vis-a-vis uh, -vis this <laughs> example right here okay so a wonderful way to not bother about buying a cooled camera just use a DSLR post I think he said 2008 that has that feature to remap something like that but anyway there you have it you can still see some little bits of color in some of these galaxies I know that one is quite a colorful one there is a tinge of the orange and reds in it um, and you can see here saturation of 18 now <coughs> on the 13th I actually bumped that up even further um, because I started to realize that um, well you can see it in the next shot when I started to shoot color, color nebula I thought you know that's not really popping enough it needs more saturation so <clears throat> more on that in a second but yeah very nice image and again that's the full screen with all the real estate the full uh, screen grab the next shot is just using that full view feature so that's what you'd see out in the screen at night and again you can now really start to see some of the little details a little black lane in there next to this reddish area here which is a star birthing hydrogen rich region and uh, you know a little bits of detail up there it's um, there's a faint fuzzy here next to that faint fuzzy uh, which are all galaxies and you can count them I mean you can see there's definitely one there that could be one there uh, there's another one there then there's this one this one uh, this one 
Uh, there is actually one behind here which I saw when I um, double clicked and got rid of this adjustments window. There's one there, there's a tiny one underneath it. Uh, there's one right there. There's another one there, another one there, another one there. Uh, uh, there's this one, this is the cat's eyes. If you turn your head at 45 to the left, they kind of look like two cat's eyes. And uh, in the dark, you could actually see this faint, um, there's actually a faint wisp from this galaxy, like a wisp. Um, so that, by the way, that's another thing I should have said at the onset. These uh, screen grabs um, don't, they always, every screen grab I've ever done seems to um, not produce the right brightness of image. It's really odd. Uh, anyway, continuing on, uh, yeah, faint fuzzy there, I think I said. Uh, another faint fuzzy down here, another faint fuzzy there. Um, so it's captured a lot of these uh, magnitude 11 to magnitude 13 images. On to the next one. Right, here we go. Started to shoot some bright nebula. Now, my personal preference, uh, oh, and by the way, this is still stacking. Uh, <coughs> all right, this is actually my test shot, which is shown on here, believe it or not, at ISO 12800. And uh, it's still very clean, very little noise in there. And by the way, 12800, no, I think it was like eight seconds. So that's what I got. Um, so it's still stacking, and I wanted to show you that even at very high ISOs, that raw image converter that AstroTest is using or maybe it is the Deep Sky Stacker back end at 64-bit, I don't know, but that is a very clean shot for ISO 12800. In JPEG this is very pixelated and grainy. And again all I did, auto expand, let it do all of its settings uh, and this is where I started to notice some things creeping in. I had to increase the red slightly, which is to the left here. Uh, in order to see something, and um, I thought, gee, that's that's a bit odd. Well, you know, this is normally very brilliant red; it really pops. So I am going to have to learn to tweak a few more of these sliders to get something nice. But but that's still very nice. Uh, to the point, you can see block globules here going on. Okay, so yep, yeah, that is an unstacked right? <laughs> 12,800 image, which is just staggering. Um, yeah, I couldn't believe it, so I grabbed a quick screen grab. This one is later on a stack of nine of nine at the ISO 1600 on this particular night. And again, you can see box globules and stuff and so on and so forth. And uh, I still, at this point, had adjusted it using the red. Later on, on the next night, the 13th, I started really bumping the saturation up to get better views of this. But I must admit, I do prefer less garish colors. I do prefer these more uh, pastel versions of it. Uh, it just seems a lot more natural to me than the really garish ones you see where things really pop out. So for me this is uh, fine. And again I still see little star trailing going on. Mind you the little battery I stuck in was a little tiny instead of a big massive um, deep cycle 120 amp hour it was like one of those little tiny motorcycle batteries. I think it's like 18 amp hours and to be honest, I didn't even charge it. I don't know what voltage it had going through it. But you'll see the shots later on um, the next night are uh, much sharper. Obviously the Trifford, a lot of faint nebulosity details going on around here. And again, I just clicked, again this is a stack of 9, ISO 8, uh, uh, 1600, uh, 60 seconds. Auto expand, again, no hot pixels visible. It was a fantastic tip that, Mr. Clark Vision, thank you very much. Uh, again, clicked auto expand, uh, brought the red up a, a tad, um, and really that's about it. Everything else you can see saturation still 18, this lens gradient still around that 31. Uh, I must have at some point bumped it up from 50, which is, unless it does it when you click the auto expand, but I remember the auto expand first was 50, and I've bumped that up to 65 to get that. Okay, next one. The Sagittarius star cloud showing on all the real estate and it was starting to get really uh, cloudy at this point. I mean really cloudy. So the whole thing had a bit of a red hue and I've uh, still got the red set there and you can actually see that. It's um, Normally I do see <clears throat> a lot more sort of blueies in there even though there's really not that many blue stars up in the heavens to be honest with you. A lot of people have shots where you've got um, 
blue stars. Blue stars only account for uh, l less than, um, I think it's about one, less than 1% are blue stars, or even light blue stars. About uh, 9 to 10% are white, and the vast majority are orange to red stars. If you use Wikipedia to search that, you'll find it's true. About 90% are yellow, orange, red stars. Only about 9% are white, like our sun, and there's far less than 1%. I think it's like half a percent or less are actually light blue to what you really can consider blue. Uh, so be very aware of that when you start mucking around with your color hues and a modded camera or any astrophotography. The majority of the sky of a yellow orange with white. 90% of the sky is yellow, orange, or red, orange, yellow, white. <clears throat> and a very tiny amount, uh, well 99% of that, and a very tiny amount, less than 1% of blue. Anyway, on to the next one. A close-up, widescreen, and again, um, yeah, it's starting to get a and I gave up after that point um, my mistake maybe I did this one what's this 1239 what's this one back again 1210 no I did do another one I did that one which is um, the Amiga Nebula or sorry Eagle Nebula um, and uh, again a bit more red um, and I'd started to muck around with saturation and other things at this point not a bad shot, shows the full real estate onto the next image, which is the uh, full screen version with the color adjustment window shut down just to have a bit of a look. And again, I can see some star trailing in this direction, probably that motorcycle battery also, not a lot of power. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, this is the 13th. This is the next uh, no, night about a week later. And totally weird, totally weird. Um, as I said, I... Uh, we had to finish up at uh, about 10.30. It was totally clouded. We couldn't even see Jupiter at that uh, site with our naked eye. I mean, you couldn't see anything. Um, and that was kind of my, my judgment each night is how good are the sky conditions. Um, so this shot was pretty much extraordinarily red. I, I really struggled trying to figure out how to get this to an appropriate redness. I spent quite a bit of time moving, as you can see here, the saturation and indeed the red slider here. And it's not a particularly great image. Um, you know, it's I really struggled because it, it was like a, a light, serious, high cloud haze over absolutely everything. But it is what it is, there it is. And it was great learning experience and fun to fiddle with these sliders under those conditions. Next thing I shot was in a nice clear spot, part of the sky. Around that M83, same one I shot uh, the previous uh, week on the 12th or whatever it was. Uh, sorry, not the 12th, whatever it was. The 8th, 8th of April. So you can see here, nice and steady, nice and fine, full real estate. And once again, I just clicked auto expand. But this time, have a look at this. I had learnt uh, via that last previous evening last few shots with the nebula to start playing with saturation and when I bump saturation up there lo and behold I started to get um, a lot nicer colors of what this thing really looks like with the blue dusty reflection nebula areas of dust in its arms and with little red magenta -y areas which are the star birth areas within those spiral arms and I've got good uh, star color I've got mainly whites and so forth to get it I had to really play with red green and blue these are all away from its default values of 10,000 uh, as is that saturation but the expand is just, just like when you've clicked the auto expand it goes straight to there and I once again was using my around 30 30 to 35 lens gradient to get rid of it with this particular scope and this um, 23 millimeter sensored uh, Canon Stack of nine again. Now this time, you can see over here, ISO 800, I shot all through this evening. But uh, I was able to get this image, um, as I said, with a lot of this tweaking, because this, even though it was nice and clear in that area, it still was giving me these weird uh, colors, which I couldn't figure out until later on when it totally became overcast. I went, ah, oh, must have been 
thicknesses of high serious cloud or something that was causing this. Next shot, that's just a zoomed in version of the previous shot and as you can see, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you can see first of all, uh, considering it's a zoomed in unguided shot, oh there's a, there's a, there's a galaxy. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, you can see the stars are nice and generally um, round, okay, and it is it is zoomed in quite a lot because you can see that's the native image scale and this is when you're zoomed in, so it's zoomed in heaps, okay, <clears throat> anyway, um, still a stack of 9, but ISO 800 as well, okay, there's all the color settings uh, as they were before. Next image, uh, we went across to uh, good old Eta Carina, and um, yeah, it um, had lots of different red, green, blue color adjustments again, slightly different saturation. I'm really having to play with those to get, especially on that night, to get good um, colors. Uh, but it turned out very well. You can see the brown dust areas here. A lot of times that comes out red in people's shots and it's not really, It's there's a lot of brown in that object where, where there is dusty areas. You can even see it here. You can see that dust area there, that reflection dust area um, right there uh, and it's brown and darker colour and even these fainter areas in between. So I was very happy that that got pulled out of it. Uh, you can see um, sort of blue tinges right out here, but then it is uh, it is black like here, 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 black black space, black space back around there, black space there. So this bluish tinge is you know even out here is well this looks to be I've gone too far with the lens gradient to be honest with you for that to be that blue there. But anyway, um, it is what it is, and these what I was going to say is even with these dark areas here these very faint blue um, reflection areas here must be the actual colors of what is going on otherwise this wouldn't have been black space appearing here for instance in the middle so this bluish tinge area here has got to be the rightish colors considering this is also brown dusty areas and this red nebulosity and stuff around uh, the star Eta Et Carina, uh, which is that one right there um, and even its color is pretty darn good it's um, a, it's a giant star and uh, it's a little bit yellowish but um, there you go so yeah that was a wonderful shot and getting towards uh, you can see here by nine o'clock getting towards the end of the evening when you know, we started to realize this cloud and stuff everywhere same thing ISO 860 second shots and nine of them stacked on to the next one and uh, I don't know why it's the zoomed in view but or have I done a complete circle here uh, might have gone full cycle uh, we're back to um, NGC 5128, uh, which is the uh, Amiga Centauri. Anyway, so there we have it. Um, yes, we've gone full circle. So that was the viewing for that evening and the learnings and uh, a bit of a different video. Like I said, um, uh, I'm not going to have you guys sit there for nine times nine shots for all of that. And hopefully um, you would have you know, gained a bit by my blabbing as I went along about the sorts of things I did and came across when I was experimenting with the stacking and so forth. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, subscribe. I've got lots of videos with little helpful how-tos and uh, very short exposure astrophotography. Well, EAA really, not astrophotography. Observing with the camera and uh, I'll be doing a lot more in the future. Uh, particularly one I want to try in the future is I have a video on my webs on my YouTube channel where I've used uh, Deep Sky Stacker Live to live stack, not Astro Toaster using it, but just straight using the Canon EOS utilities to drop into Deep Sky Stacker Live to stack, and from there straight into Lightroom. And the reason Lightroom is a real attraction is it has a fantastic noise reduction tool and a fantastic uh, anti vignetting tool. So <clears throat> When I saw that ISO 12800 shot being so smooth in Astro Toaster, I thought, and that was a single image, I thought, wow, I'd really like to shoot ISO 400, say, 4 seconds or 8 seconds, and just stack 4 of them to get twice the signal to noise, and um, 
try it for outreach because four eight second shots stacked almost immediately on uh, in, that's how quick DSS Live is by itself and almost immediately stretched uh, as a matter of fact you can apply a preset save stretch in Lightroom uh, would make EAA fantastic as a matter of fact I could probably just go that 8 second ISO 12800 shot and denoise and de-vignette uh, it and be done you know, straight into Lightroom and I'd really like to try that out so watch that in a future video thank you very much for watching sorry for the length of the video but lots of information in it cheers